Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we go into the files of the J. Richard Sports Diary and listen to him tell the story of the 1,000-mile dog sled journey. In frozen Alaska, 34 degrees below zero is considered a mild temperature. After all, temperatures can reach 65 and 70 below. So a dog sled trip of 100 miles can strike terror into the hearts of even the most experienced dog sled men. Well, on March 26, 1936, a sledder drove a team of huskies into Fairbanks from Juneau, a distance of 1,000 miles. Prepared for the arrival, the townspeople issued a tremendous greeting on their visitor. You see, the person standing on the sled was 37-year-old Mary Joyce, a woman. It had taken her three months to reach the Richardson Highway into Fairbanks. Incredible, but true. I'm Jay Richards for Sports Diary. J. Richard's Sports Diary was always amusing and educational all in one. And that's today's Closet Sports Soundbite. I'm William Taylor. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we go back to 1984. In continuance of our 25th anniversary, look at the United States Football League. This was a contest in the Superdome as the Michigan Panthers took on the New Orleans Breakers. The Breakers end up winning 10-3 to in a very defensive battle. The only scoring touchdown occurred thanks to Louisiana native and McNeese State graduate Buford Jordan scoring the only touchdown. First, you will hear announcers Lee Gross Cup and Tim Brandt comment on Buford Jordan as a runner and receiver. Then you will hear that only touchdown play call, followed by an on-field interview that Buford did with then WVU we and ABC commentator Jim Bergamo. Buford Jordan particularly, Tim, has been a pleasant surprise for them, and as you look at his numbers right there, you see that he's the most effective rookie running back in the league, even better than Mike Rozier, already over the 700-yard mark and averaging better than six yards per carry, and what's really been pleasant is that he's been equally effective as a receiver. Again, they go with four wideouts, one set back in the shotgun formation, back there with Johnny Walton. And Walton going for the touchdown. He's got Jordan open. Touchdown, New Orleans. Again, they had the linebacker isolated on Buford Jordan, and Jordan beat him to the corner. Wide open, and Johnny Walton hitting for the score. Well, the hero right now here in New Orleans is Buford Jordan, who has a touchdown, and right now he's with Jim Bergamo. Buford, that 25-yard scoring play, you said Michigan really didn't show you anything. It was just a play. You've been working in practice, and you decided to go for it at that time. Yeah, all it was, you know, we just had the two receivers, like, come down and kind of pick on my man and slow him up and me get open, and, you know, it worked. Lee wants me to ask you, you think that new hairstyle of yours made you faster? <laughs> no, I don't think so. You know, it's just something to do. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. In case you were wondering about the haircut comment, Buford had actually shaved his head going into that contest. Buford would finish the 1984 season with 1,227 yards rushing, almost twice as much as the rather touted Marcus Dupree, who left school after one year to play in the USFL and went through on and off injury in his career in 84 and 85. New Orleans Breakers would only finish the season 8 and 10 after starting 5 and 0 and 7 and 4 leading into this contest against Michigan. The following year, the Breakers would pack their bags and move to Portland, Oregon. But for the one year they were here, it was pretty exciting. And that's it for today's Closet Sports Soundbite. I'm William Taylor. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we go back to an important game in Saints history, October 28, 1979, at the Washington Redskins. In this contest, the New Orleans Saints would stop the Redskins' defense 17 times on goal-to-goal -goal situations. The deciding play of the game came with 59 seconds left. Here's the call with Gary Bender and Sonny Jurgensen. Fourth and goal this time, just inside the 15-yard line. 59 seconds left in the game. Heisman on the fourth down, rolling out, looking. He's going to try to run, and he can't get rid of it. He's done. Excellent play by Lois Grooms. It's Grooms again that made the play. Sonny, you're down there on the field. Can you believe the play of Lois Grooms? Joe just couldn't not find anybody to throw the ball to. He waited till the last second, couldn't come up with anybody. As this New Orleans Saints defense has been the story of the day. Saints go on to win the contest 14-10. to It was the first time in New Orleans Saints history that they would be all alone in first place of their division. Afterward, Sonny Jurgensen talked to members of the Saints defensive backfield on the field. First, here's strong safety Ray Brown. Thank you, Sonny. It was an 11-man effort, and I can't say enough about the defensive line. They put tremendous pressure, and they contained Weisman, and they made our job a lot easier. Next, defensive back Tommy Myers. Well, I think we covered pretty well today. Uh, we knew that their game plan was to try to throw the ball short, and we tightened up on our coverages. We stayed in basically zones and didn't want to beat ourselves on one-on-one -on -one coverage, and uh, our line just got after. We had some injuries in the line, and Mike Fultz came in and played a heck of a game, got a couple sacks, just did a great job. 
Then cornerback Clarence Chapman. Well, like I said, everybody's back there is healthy now. We're feeling good. It's a lot more concentration. Like uh, Ray said earlier, the Lions, the Lions giving a tremendous rush, so it's helping everybody out back there. And finally, cornerback Eric Felton. Oh, I think, you know, Ray made a tremendous help, you know, to our defense because if they can't run outside, they're not exactly going to beat us, you know, and he's the instrumental part to the flex. And as far as the corner play, you know, I thought when we got back, you know, things would get together, come together on our defense with just jail. The New Orleans Saints would go on to finish the 1979 season at 8-8, eight and eight, and at that time, it was the best record in New Orleans Saints history. And that does it for today's Closet Sports Soundbite. I'm William Taylor. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we go back to a not-so-pleasant moment in New Orleans Saints history. November the 12th, 1978. The New Orleans Saints host the Atlanta Falcons in what was technically the first sellout in the Louisiana Superdome for the Saints. At this point, it's 17-13 to with 26 seconds left. The Saints had the ball fourth down and two at the Falcons 45, needing just the first down to run out the clock and win the game. Here's the call by Frank Lieber and Tom Matty. Fourth down. Long two needed for the first down, and they give it to Muncie. Same play, and Muncie has stopped short of the first down. So the Falcons will take over, and here comes the offensive unit with 19 seconds. And what happens next can simply be described as, well, indescribable. Here's the call. Bogdowski going low for Wallace Francis. Francis leaps, throws in the air. Pass and they do it, Frank. Alfred Jackson, the rookie, being mobbed as is Steve Barkowski. The desperation pass with 10 seconds left to play. And the Falcons have taken the lead. 19 to 17. 57 yards for a touchdown. And this crowd is stunned. Here it is again. This is just a desperation pass. 10 seconds remaining on the clock. The ball is thrown up in the air. Watch it fly up. It's intended for Francis, and Jackson picks it out of the air after it's tipped and goes into the end zone. Falcons can't believe their good fortune. You talk about a Hail Mary pass. The Falcons go on to win the game 20-17. to Ironically, two weeks later, in the rematch at Atlanta, because of a pass interference penalty, the Falcons wind up beating the Saints again by the same score, 20-17. to The Saints would finish the season 7-9, and and Atlanta would go on to a wild card berth in the playoffs where they would beat Philadelphia in the first round. And that's it for today's Closet Sports Soundbite. I'm William Taylor. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we look back at three interesting notes from the career of one-time Saints general manager Jim Finks. For example, did you know that in the spring of 1992, he concepted what is the current NFL roster format? There were some concerns leading into the 92 season that too many teams were abusing the injured reserve clause, where you could keep a contracted player on the injured list for four weeks or more, him not count against the roster, and bring in another player, possibly at another need position to fill the spot. question was, were some teams asking backup players to fake injuries in order to make that roster spot open? Well, his original concept was where the roster would be at 50 men per game but only 40 of them would be active later a committee modified that to make it 53 men and anywhere from 45 to 47 men active per game the second interesting note in his career is how he inadvertently changed the course of professional wrestling. Oh, you've never heard this one? Well, you see, back in 1967, when he became the general manager of the Minnesota Vikings, he was shopping around at some of the undrafted free agents from the 67 draft. One young man that he talked to from the University of Oklahoma was an offensive lineman. This offensive lineman was somewhat interested in playing for the Vikings, but there was one problem. Mr. Finks didn't want this young man to wrestle professionally during the offseason. This young man felt that pro wrestling would probably end up being his career in the long run, so he turned down a contract with the Vikings and wound up becoming not only one of the biggest names on the wrestling circuit, but pretty big as a wrestling promoter as well. His name was Cowboy Bill Watts, and of course for years ran the Mid-South Territory. Finally, another concept that Mr. Jim Finks brought, more specifically to the New Orleans Saints, is something that we still enjoy today. You see, when Mr. Finks was general manager of the Chicago Cubs in 1984, he introduced the concept to that team of the fan club convention where current and former players can meet the fans in a convention-like setting. Well, in 1989, Mr. Finks brought that here to New Orleans under what was originally called the Houdat Festival. An array of former and current Saints players came out to meet the fans over a three-day period. It would later be renamed the Saints Fan Fest in 1993 and is now better known as the Saints Draft Fest while Mr. Finks has not been with us since 1994, it's good to know that one of his ideas continues to live on. 
and creates a positive atmosphere for fans to gather under in the hopes that the next season will definitely be better than the last. What a great way to remember a man's legacy. And that's it for the Closet Sports Soundbite. I'm William Taylor. On this edition of the Closet Sports Soundbite, we revisit one of our old formats, the Audio Archive Answer Find. What we're about to do is play four voices from the past, mainly involved in the world of sports, and try to guess who they are. First, you'll hear the four voices, and then we'll give you hints afterwards as to who each of them are, followed by the answer. So without further ado, here's today's Audio Archive Answer Find, and the hint we'll give you is that they all have to do with the New Orleans Saints. I had cut one of my dreads off, and I left it like in my drawer. One of my good friends, she's she's Creole, and she was like, "Don't don't leave that piece of hair laying around, because someone if it gets in the wrong person's hands, you know, you're gonna be in, gonna be in trouble." Be able to measure production in the workplace on Mondays during football season. I, I assure you, uh, when the Saints lose, it's off. I mean, it really affects people. I never felt in New Orleans going in there that we couldn't be good. I mean, I wouldn't have taken a job if I didn't think we could be good. I can't say I believe in it, but I do chuckle at it, and I enjoy hearing it, to be honest with you. Our first mystery voice was an accomplished running back at the University of Texas before spending three years in New Orleans before heading off to Miami. Our second voice was a Heisman Trophy candidate in 1970 who spent 14 years in the NFL. Our third voice was an accomplished winning football coach in another league before joining the Saints. And finally, our fourth voice was a longtime behind-the-scenes personnel man before getting the head job in New Orleans. The answers are Ricky Williams, followed by Archie Manning, Jim Mora, and finally, Randy Mueller. We hope you enjoyed today's version of the Closet Sports Soundbite. Until next time, I'm William Taylor. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we continue our 25th anniversary look of the United States Football League by going back to an exciting contest played March 25, 1984 in the Louisiana Superdome. As the New Orleans Breakers hosted the Chicago Blitz, Dick Corey's New Orleans Breakers would have a true shootout on their hands as the game would end up tied 35-35 in regulation. Here's a sample of some of those incredible scores as well as some of the amazing plays. It's Dupree over the top. Jordan and Shaleen now, 24 and 25, are set up behind Walden on second down and eight. Johnny gets it off into the corner, and Jordan throws it down, touchdown. Evans quickly into the end zone, hits Marcus Anderson, and touchdown. Go to the I formation now. That may be in Buford will have a little more room and might slant this one. He is going to run for the corner. Got a great block from Shaleen. Tremendous block from Shaleen, and walks into the end zone. Vince Evans finds a little hole, starts running, fakes it, turns it back. Going to get some help now. Now if he finds somebody to throw it to, does in the end zone, touchdown! Pass is caught by Mark Keogh from this distance this season. The punter does it, does the holding. Love a leg, and the kick is good. The Chicago Blitz pick up three, throws it as far as he can, and lock it, going after it. The game would go to overtime as Johnny Walton, quarterback for the New Orleans Breakers, would decide the game on a 44-yard pass to Frank Lockett. Walton sets up to go deep for Lockett. He's got it. Touchdown. The final score would be 41-35 to in a true old-fashioned shootout by any league standards. This has been the Closet Sports Soundbite.
Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we go back to October 2nd, 1977, as the New Orleans Saints would visit the Chicago Bears. Both teams were 0-2, desperate for a win. The Saints were coached by Hank Stram, the Chicago Bears by Jack Pardee. The key to the Saints' victory was their defense. No, not just stopping the Bears' offense, but actually scoring two defensive touchdowns. Here's the first touchdown, scored by Bob Pollard after Bob Avellini fumbled upon getting hit by Alex Price. Scott and Rather are wide to either side as Avellini takes the deep drop. Here's the big rush, free football. This might go. This might go the distance. Bob Pollard with the lineman's dream. Bob Pollard goes the distance. Alex Price was the man who came in, hit Avellini, and knocked him free. And that is the football game, although he got 8.20 left. The Chicago Bears have fallen behind 34 to 10. And people are tacking up their trench coats and bailing out of Wrigley Field or out of Soldier Field right now. Bob Pollard is the Saints defensive captain. He's their most uh, consistent player in that offensive, uh, defensive line, rather. Probably the best player on the defensive front here. He picks it up, and as Don has said, every lineman dreams of picking up a fumble or grabbing off an interception and running the distance with it. All those ball control drills, they roll them at the linemen, get their hands ready to pick it up, and I'll tell you one thing, when Bob Pollard got his hands out, he knew what to do with it. And now the second touchdown, which was an interception scored by Dynamo Jim Merlo at linebacker. Intercepted. Jim Merlo picks it off. He returned two for touchdowns last year. He's going to get his first this year. Guys closing in on him. But Merlo goes into the end zone for a touchdown. Jim Merlo was cut by Walter Payton, but the impetus of Payton hurdled himself and Jim Merlo into the end zone. And so defensemen for the New Orleans Saints have scored two touchdowns today. It is a 41-17 game. That's balanced scoring. They've done it both offensively and defensively today. Avellini should not have thrown this ball at this point because he got a lot of pressure from Alex. Threw the ball off balance, and that's the results. The play call was made by Don Crickey and Emerson Boozer. The New Orleans Saints, unfortunately, would finish that season 3-11. and Bob Pollard would end up getting traded the next season to the St. Louis Cardinals, and Jim Merlo would play with the New Orleans Saints through the end of the 1979 season. Hank Stram, after the season, would go on to work for CBS television and radio in a career that would span almost 20 years in the booth. And that does it for now. I'm William Taylor, and this has been the Closet Sports Soundbite. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we go back and look at the magic quote machine that was Jim Mora. Often serious and sometimes funny, Jim Mora had an interesting way of expressing himself from time to time. Here are some of those Mora magic moments. We just got a totally kicked. We couldn't do diddly poo offensively. We couldn't make a first down. We couldn't run the ball. We didn't try to run the ball. We couldn't complete a pass. We the second half. We we couldn't stop the run. Every time they got the ball, they went down and got points. We got our ass totally kicked in the second half. Since I don't know anything about the football team, the next thing I guess you could do would be to go to the media. <laughs> Coaching did a horrible job. The players did a horrible job. We got our kick in that second half. It's it stunk. Hell, we don't have any patience running our football. Shit, we don't. You know, we'll run it a few times and we're throwing, throwing, throwing. We ain't doing shit but throwing the ball. But don't worry, friends. We'll have more Jim Mora memories in another segment in the near future. Until next time, I'm William Taylor, and this has been the Closet Sports Soundbite. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we try to solve a mystery in New Orleans Saints history. 
It was Halloween Day 1999. The New Orleans Saints had only won one game going into their contest against the new Cleveland Browns. The Saints would kick a field goal with just under 30 seconds left to make the score 16-14. to Cleveland would get the ball back and slowly drive to their own 45-yard line when head coach Chris Palmer of the Browns told his quarterback Tim Couch to run the Big Ben offense. Couch rolled to the right, and the rest, as they say, is history. Here's Don Cricky and Steve Tasker with the call. Two seconds. Here's the blitz. Couch. Long, high ball. Lots of guys going for it. Fight in the end zone. It's time. However, there is a little bit more to just Cleveland winning the game. Defensive back Sammy Knight for the Saints was in position to knock the ball down and give the black and gold the victory. However, defensive back Tyrone Drakeford was actually late on the coverage of that play. Tyrone, being the instinctive defensive back that he was, as he approached the goal line, extended out his right arm with palm upward. His palm accidentally got into the way of Sammy Knight trying to knock the ball down. As a result, a ricochet occurred where the ball hit Tyrone Drakeford's open palm and fluttered to the right, which allowed Kevin Johnson to take two steps to the left, catch the ball in the right front corner of the end zone, and give the Cleveland Browns the win 21-16. to And as another radio commentator might say, now you know the rest of the story. And until next time, I'm William Taylor, and this has been the Closet Sports Soundbite. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we bring you more of the magical quote machine that was Jim Mora. Let's take a listen at some of those classic sound bites, and even one that was done after he left the Saints when he went to Indianapolis. You don't know what happened. You really don't know. You think you know, but you don't know. And you never will. Well, you know what? I was really happy out there today a lot of times, too. You should have caught those. Really happy. I'm really happy now. I'll be really happy when I, when I walk out that door. Really happy then. Do I like our position? No, I wish we were 3 and 10. Yeah, I like our position. We're 10 and 3 and in the playoffs, for Christ's sake. Huh? You know what? That I consider the source. I consider the source. So it don't bother me a bit. I'd like to introduce... The new coach of the New Orleans Saints, Jim Mora. I can't tell you how glad I am to be standing up here today. I, I'm, I'm so tired of, uh, of being rumored. Could have, would have, should have is the difference of what I'm talking about. The good teams don't come in and say could have. They get it done. All right? It's that simple. I'm tired of saying could have, should have, would have. That's why we ain't good enough yet. Because we're saying could have and they ain't. You bet we are. You bet we are. When you get there, you are a playoff team, and the New Orleans Saints, 1987, are a playoff team. Hey, we were 2-5 and five at one point, and, 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 and a lot of people in this room gave up on us, gave up on us, buried us, said our season was over, dead, gone, forget it, close the door, close the hearse, close the court on the Saints. A lot of people in this room said that. It didn't happen. That's one of the most asinine questions I've ever heard. But to be honest with you, when you ask me that question, it really doesn't surprise me. Next. Playoffs? Don't talk about playoffs. You kidding me? Playoffs? I just hope we can win a game. Jim Moore would coach the Saints for a ten and a half seasons and walk away with a winning record, the only Saints head coach at that time to do so. He brought the club to their first ever playoff appearances, four in total. His overall job in New Orleans granted him a Saints Hall of Fame induction in 2002. Until next time, I'm William Taylor, and this has been the Closet Sports Soundbite. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we look at a true sports historic moment. October 3, 1951. It was called the shot heard round the world. A walk-off home run hit by Bobby Thompson, an outfielder for the New York Giants, off of Brooklyn Dodgers pitcher Ralph Branca. A contest held at the Polo Grounds to determine the National League pennant in what was called the Pennant Playoff Series. A series that the Giants won two games to one, and specifically won this game 5-4. to four. Let's go back and listen to that magical moment with this audio from the great Red Barber. Red Barber out there. Branca pitches and Thompson takes a strike. Big Branca called on for his most important job in his baseball career. Well, everything's the most important for all of these players to come around. Wow. 
Many history fans would know that the shot heard round the world was a term from a poem by Ralph Waldo Emerson to describe the American Revolutionary War. Fans of the New York baseball giants will also remember that this play was also called The Miracle of Coogan's Bluff. Another reason why it was called that, late in the season, the Giants was actually trailing the Dodgers for the National League pennant by a double-digit figure. While Ralph Branca is often remembered for throwing the home run pitch that Bobby Thompson hit, and of course, as a result, lost the game. The winning pitcher for the New York Giants in this contest was Larry Jensen, who finished the regular season with a record of 23-11. and Unfortunately, the miracle wouldn't last, as the New York Giants would have to play the New York Yankees in the 1951 World Series and lose the series in six games. It was a magical moment for magical times in the great American pastime. That's all for today's Closet Sports Soundbite. I'm William Taylor. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we look back at the life of Robert Craig Knievel, known to the rest of the world as Evil Knievel, a very popular motorcycle daredevil artist who was born in Butte, Montana on October 17, 1938, and would live for some 69 years. The story goes that he got his nickname one night after being arrested as a young man and placed into the Butte, Montana jail. In the cell next to him was a gentleman whose last name was Knoffel, no relation. The story further goes that the deputy on duty that night said, Why, look what we have, awful can awful and evil can evil. Hence the nickname stuck. He would go on to build an empire in the world of daredevil jumping. One of his most famous jumps, which resulted in him nearly dying, was at Caesar's Palace where he tried to jump the famous fountains. He would remain hospitalized for several months after that, only to recover in grand form. He would eventually sign a contract with ABC's Wide World of Sports. In fact, to this day, Four of his jumps that he made on ABC Wide World of Sports is still amongst the 20 most watched Wide World of Sports episodes ever. He tried to jump the Snake River Canyon in 1974 near Twin Falls, Idaho. But unfortunately, the jump failed as he crashed just shy of the other side of the Snake River Canyon as his parachute on his so-called rocket cycle opened too early. Here's an audio sample of the time he tried to jump some 13 buses at Wembley Stadium, only to lose control of his motorcycle on the landing ramp. You'll hear the commentary from Frank Gifford, then after you hear the motorcycle peel out, you will hear Evil Knievel give a very emotional speech to the crowd at hand. A few months later, Evil Knievel would jump again and would continue to jump until the early 80s. Evil Knievel's last primetime event occurred on CBS television as he tried to jump over a pool of sharks in the late 70s. He made it over the swimming pool, but unfortunately lost control on the return ramp. His last jump was in March of 1981 in Hollywood, Florida. Knievel's popularity was so great that in June of 77, Warner Brothers starred him in his own movie called Viva Knievel, featuring other stars like Lauren Hutton, Gene Kelly, and Red Buttons. The movie, unfortunately, didn't turn out that well. In April of 2007, Evil Knievel appeared on Reverend Robert H. Schuller's Hour of Power televangelist program to announce that he believed in Jesus Christ for the first time and would remain a devoted religious man until passing away the following November. And that does it for today's Closet Sports Soundbite. I'm William Taylor. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we once again go into the archives for Jay Richard Sports Diary as Jay talks about a segment called Strange Prize Fights. Today, let's examine some unusual boxing events in history. First, 1879, and about in Chippewa Falls, Canada, lightweight Arthur Chambers won the championship from Johnny Clark in the longest title fight in boxing history. Then in 1942, champion Joe Lewis knocked out Abe Simon in the 21st defense of his heavyweight crown and donated his purse of $25,000 to the Army Emergency Relief Fund. Yet the Brown Bomber couldn't get a break from the IRS some years later. And in 1947, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Harvard's Tommy Rogers took the 155-pound championship with a second-round TKO of Summersby Douse in New Hampshire. But catch this bizarre fact. Tommy Rogers was a one-armed prize fighter. Incredible but true. And our next feature, America Loses the Greatest Athlete Ever. I'm Jay Richards, the Sports Diary. Remembering a great broadcaster as well as remembering some great stories along the way. I'm William Taylor, and this has been the Closet Sports Soundbite. 
Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we go back to the summer of 1995. More specifically, Canton, Ohio and the Pro Football Hall of Fame inductions. One member of that distinguished class was Jim Finks, who was being inducted for his administrative work with the Minnesota Vikings, Chicago Bears, and New Orleans Saints. He helped build the roster in Minnesota that would go to two Super Bowls while he was there and another two after he left. And in Chicago, he helped build the Chicago Bears into a team that would go on to win Super Bowl XX after he left, more specifically recruiting 20 of the 22 starters in that contest. Then in 1986, he came to New Orleans and with coach Jim Mora helped build the New Orleans Saints into a winner for the first time ever. Here is an excerpt of his Hall of Fame speech, which was presented by his son, Jim Finks Jr. To sum up what Jim Finks was all about, he kept these words written on a piece of paper in his wallet at all times. If we are ever unlucky enough to have it made, then we will be spectators and not participants in life. It's the journey, not the arrival that counts. Does the road wind uphill all the way? Yes, to the very end. Jim Finks was known as a former Steeler, Viking, and Bear, but it's no coincidence he left this world a saint. And today, along with my family and friends, I'm proud to represent my dad for his induction into Pro Football Hall of Fame's class of 95, with two of the greatest receivers of all time, Steve Largent and Kellen Winslow, and two of the greatest defenders of all time, and Leroy Selman and the late Henry Jordan Sr. Thank you very much. Jim Finks was an interesting mix of a business administrator, one-time professional football player, a gentleman with a tremendous sense of humor and down-to-earth qualities which made him very liked by many members of the community. He passed away in May of 1994 at the age of 66 and would also be inducted in the Saints Hall of Fame a few months prior to going into Canton. And that does it for today's Closet Sports Soundbite. I'm William Taylor. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we go back to one of our regular features, the Audio Archive Answer Find. Today, four mystery voices from the past, and we'd like for you to guess who they are. And this time, we're not going to tell you what they have in common. You'll have to figure that out at the end of the segment. So without further ado, here's probably our hardest version ever of the Audio Archive Answer Find. We're here in Sun Destin Resort in beautiful Destin, Florida. So sit back, relax, and take a look at our first day of shooting. Well, about my body, I've been very blessed, I have to say, with genetics. We didn't have a name yet. It was brand new. We didn't know what, what was going to happen. Um, since then, we've evolved. Hello again. Fine, and you? Yes, I am. This is my second year. Our first mystery voice worked for Cox Sports Television as a field reporter for both Zephyr's Baseball and High School Football's Game of the Week. Our second voice had a father who played professional football, and she once had national notoriety as a contestant on NBC's Fear Factor. Our third mystery voice holds the answer to a very obscure trivia question in New Orleans TV history. She was the first ever guest of the Morton Anderson television show, which ran during the summer of 1994. Our last voice was the first runner-up in the Miss Louisiana USA pageant in 1993 and happens to be a former guest of the Ed Clancy radio show. The answers to our questions, the first voice was Melanie Wester, our second voice was Tamika Lee, our third voice was Angie Wagaspak, and our fourth voice, Suzette Lampard Brantley. Oh, by the way, didn't I tell you? The one thing they all have in common, they all at one time were members of the Saints Asians dance team. Until next time, I'm William Taylor, and this has been another edition of the Closet Sports Soundbite. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we go back to 1988. Late in the month of May, it's the second jewel of the Triple Crown, the Preakness. New Orleans' own risen star, owned and trained by Riley Lamarck and Louis Roussel, are trying to make a comeback after coming in third place at the Kentucky Derby a few weeks earlier. Here's that exciting call of the Preakness from ABC. And they're off, a clean break. And 49er gets to the front by a head, but on the outside winning colors, takes up the challenge, and those two are stride for stride. In the middle of the racetrack, Finder's Choice, a close-up third, and Rico Classic along the inside fourth with Risen Star past the stands for the first time, and it's 49er with Pat Day aboard, leading the way about three paths out from the rail. On the outside, that's winning colors in second position, right at his neck, Risen Star stalking the top two in third. The top two have had it their own way as they go to the far turn. On the inside, 49er on the outside, the Philly winning colors, those two stride for stride, Risen Star right there in third, looking for racing room and now finding it at the rail, Risen Star with a quick burst of speed up to take command, it's Risen Star on the inside, leading it by a head, winning colors on the outside, second, 49er between them, third, three of them across the track as they move into the final quarter mile, Risen Star has the lead, winning colors on the outside, tries to close the gap, 49er dropping back, and down the stretch they come, Risen Star with Eddie Delahousie shows the way by a length and a half, on the inside it's the Philly, on the outside, 
And afterwards, here's a joyous jockey and Eddie Delahousse talking to Jim McKay. Uh, when I reached the quarter pole, I said, well, I might as well go on with it. And he really excelled. Okay, Eddie. Yeah. Beautiful job. You know, <laughs> Louie keeps saying he's not a very good trainer, but he must be good enough. Uh, he broke real sharp today. He was a lot sharper today, and I got him running uh, a little sooner than last time. Last When he ran in the derby, he wasn't that sharp, and today he was. Uh, Rus Louis Roussel, the trainer, uh, sharpened him up fairly well, and he was laying much closer than he was in the derby, Jim. And uh, he, I cut the corner. Everybody was staying out, and everybody said how deep the track was. I took a chance and stayed in. I wasn't dead on the rail, but uh, I was in there enough. It definitely was a proud moment for all New Orleans sports fans that day, and they'd be even prouder just a couple of weeks later when the Belmont would be run. But we'll save that for another show. Until next time, I'm William Taylor, and this has been the Closet Sports Soundbite. On today's edition of the Closet Sports Soundbite, we go back to June of 1988, the third jewel of the Triple Crown, the Belmont. Risen Star, coming off a Preakness victory some two weeks earlier, was going to try and make it another successful, victorious day. But don't let me tell you about it. Let's hear the call, courtesy of ABC. And they're off. And winning colors quickly takes command. Risen Star on the outside into the second spot. And between horses, King Post is up close early in third. Then it's a gap of about three. Ryan's time is fourth on the outside. Granakis is racing fifth. And Cephas is the trailer as the sextet rounds the first turn. Now heads apart, Risen Star on the outside. The Preakness winner takes command from the Derby winner. Winning colors along the inside, drops back second by two and a half. King Post a close up there, that's the longest shot on the board. And he's within striking distance. Three and a half back, Brian's time. They move to the top of the stretch, and Risen Star has the lead by three. The Philly is dropping back as King Post makes his move on the outside. They're approaching the quarter pole, and Risen Once again, Jim McKay had the pleasure of interviewing the winning jockey, Eddie Delahousse. Eddie, congratulations. Thank you very much. Done it again. Yeah, it's great. It's a great feeling. Great to win the Belmont. I tell you what, Louis Roussel and his crew done a hell of a job with this horse. Well, so did you, Eddie, and congratulations. We'll talk to you further when you get into the winner's circle. Thank you. Eddie Delahousse has now won two Kentucky Derbies, and he won them consecutively. He's won the Preakness, and now he's won the Belmont. And Risen Star is well on his way to glory. Since Risen Star was the overall best finisher in the Kentucky Derby, Preakness, and Belmont combined, the horse and its owners, Ronnie Lamarck and Louis Roussel, cashed in a $1 million bonus from Chrysler in what was called the Triple Crown Challenge. Without a doubt, Risen Star made 1988 one of the most interesting sports seasons in New Orleans history. And that does it for now. I'm William Taylor, and this has been the Closet Sports Soundbite. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we go back to 1988 in the beginning of the Triple Crown Series at the Kentucky Derby in Churchill Downs. Many New Orleanians had their eye on a local horse by the name of Risen Star, owned by Ronnie Lamarck and Louis Roussel. And while the race didn't turn out as many had hoped, it was the beginning of a very interesting run for the native horse. Here's the call. And they're off. From between horses, Din's Dancer. There goes the Roan Philly winning colors, grabbing the lead right from the start.
after that is Brian's time. Keep post on the far outside. Then Risen Star. Then Granakis, followed by Intensive Command. Cephas is second last. And the trailer is lively one with Bill Shoemaker. They go to the far turn, and it's still winning colors showing the way after the half in 46 and 4. And three quarters went 111 and 2. And no one has challenged her yet. Along the inside, proper reality has gained ground and moved into second. Seeking the gold is racing third. 49 is fourth. And private terms on the outside fifth as they come to the top of the stretch. She's led from the start. Every pole a winning one. And it's winning colors showing the way as they straighten away in the lane. Winning colors doing it just like Keyway Lucas said she would. Taking command and drawing off. Now she's in front by three. Proper reality is second. Here comes 49er, two-year-old champ from last year. Putting in a bit on the While Risen Star only came in third place, it was the beginning of a very successful run. That's it for today. I'm William Taylor. This has been the Closet Sports Soundbite. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we answered a question, who is Vinko Bogatai? Oh, you don't know the answer? Well, I guess I better explain. He was a native of Yugoslavia, participating in the 1970 World Ski Jump Championship in Ogersdorf, Germany. It would be on his second or third attempts that he would make American sports television history. Here's the call by Bud Palmer and Art Devlin. Vinko Bogataz, the Yugoslavian the youngster, is inexperienced. He fell on his first jump. A lot of speed in that track. Look, look, at, him. look at him go! Oh, oh. oh, baby, what a terrible fall. Okay, you still don't know? Well, here's the second musical hint, and maybe that'll help. That's right. Vingo Bogatai is the skier who falls off of the slope that is frequently used on the opening of ABC Wide World of Sports and has been used in their opening since 1971. Here's Vinko Bogatai through an interpreter about being remembered for such a moment on American television. The difference between victory and defeat in sports is well said in the thoughts of Jim McKay because the difference between the two can be very slight. All sportsmen should know that. But for the record, he did make his third jump successful, and here it is. Big jump for Vinko Bogataz. He's looking up at his 410 feet. And while Vinko Bogataz is remembered for a not-so-proud moment in American sports television history, the fact that he did overcome the accident to get back on his skis and do it again shows testament to his endurance. That's all for now. I'm William Taylor. This has been the Closet Sports Soundbite. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we actually paid tribute to two of the most used songs on television as it pertains to Major League Baseball. The two songs in question stem from probably the most famous baseball retrospective show in broadcast history. This Week in Baseball debuted in 1977, mostly using the voice of Mel Allen to describe the previous week's Major League Baseball action. After Mel Allen passed away in 1996, Warner Fusell took over the role as lead announcer. The concept for This Week in Baseball was originally thought of by Commissioner Bowie Kuhn, who wanted the show to be somewhat similar to what NFL Films was doing for that pro football league. Over the years, the format of This Week in Baseball has been adjusted somewhat, especially since the Fox Network took over the production of the show in 2000. The familiar opening theme music, which was used for many decades on the show, was composed by Mike Vickers, a gentleman who was once a member of the Manford Man Band. That opening theme song was called Jet Set, and here's a famous sample of it right now.
Some of you may notice that that song is a little bit familiar because at one time it was also the theme for the game show Jackpot starring Jeff Edwards in 1974 and 75. To close out this segment of the Closet Sports Soundbite, it's only appropriate that we use the closing music of This Week in Baseball as well. Also composed by Mike Vickers, the name of this song is called Gathering Crowds. Until next time, I'm William Taylor. This has been the Closet Sports Soundbite. Who could have imagined that on September 24th, 1921, when the McManus household brought their son James Kenneth into the world in Philadelphia, that he would change the face of television sports broadcasting forever? A graduate of Loyola College of Maryland and later a captain in the U.S. Navy during World War II, the gentleman that would later be known as Jim McKay worked in news, sports, and believe it or not, game shows from 1947 at WMAR Television in Baltimore through his tenure at CBS in New York in the 1950s. As the decade changed over to the 1960s, he joined ABC where he would forever be known as the host and voice of ABC's Wide World of Sports. In its unending variety, unfolds on ABC's Wide World of Sports. I'm Jim McKay at Franklin Field in Philadelphia for the 67th Annual Penn Relay Carnival. It was April 29th, 1961, and those of us who stood shivering in the damp air of Franklin Field in Philadelphia that day had no idea that we were about to launch the longest-running and most successful sports anthology show he would work for 12 winter and summer Olympic broadcasts, several Indy 500 races, and win 12 Emmys and a George Polk Award for sports and news coverage. ABC Sports and the Olympics first came together at the Winter Games of 1964 in Innsbruck, Austria. The pictures were black and white, the coverage on a delayed basis, except for limited use of the only satellite then available for a few minutes at a time. Four years later in Mexico came the most astounding single athletic achievement of our time, the long jump of Bob Beeman. Beeman took off into sports history, leaping 29 feet, two and a half inches. The world record at the time was 27, four and three quarters, almost two feet shorter than Beeman's. This was a record that was to last for 22 years. Munich, 1972. Mark Spitz of California setting another Olympic mark that may never be equaled. Seven gold, seven world records in swimming. More millions than ever were watching the games now, and they found a new foreign favorite. Olga Corbett was a last-minute substitute on the Soviet gymnastics team. But in one 30-second performance, she became a favorite in every American living room. This, that is a historic performance you're watching right now in gymnastics. Oh, my God! Wow. One very interesting note comes from his love for horse racing, not because of his presence at ABC's coverage of the Triple Crown, but from his founding of Maryland Million Day, which is a series of 12 races designed to promote Maryland's rich background in the horse breeding industry. Every now and then, some of his broadcasts did become a little humorous. Here's an exchange during an Olympic broadcast between McKay and Howard Cosell. Now back to the indomitable dominion of one Jim McKay. Dominion of one someday, Howard, someday. In our next Closet Sports Soundbite, we specifically look at one of his most emotional moments on camera, the 1972 Summer Olympics hostage crisis. For the Closet Sports Soundbite, I'm William Taylor. As we continue our tribute to the life and times of Jim McKay, we look back at one of the most unfortunate situations that he had to cover in his sports career. 1972. The Summer Olympics were going on in Munich, Germany. The drama would unfold for some 16 hours. Here are some of those on-air moments as being covered by Jim McKay. No day associated with sport has been as horrible as September 5th, 1972. It's difficult now to bring back the feeling of total shock and disbelief we all felt when the terrorists, some disguised as athletes, scaled the fence of the Olympic Village, invaded the quarters of the Israeli Olympic team, killed one man, and took others as hostages. We at ABC Sports remember that we were on the air reporting the events for 16 hours. Good afternoon. I'm Jim McKay speaking to you from ABC Sports headquarters just outside the Olympic Village in Munich, West Germany. On a lovely late summer afternoon, the tense vigil continues. In a bizarre, strange, and terrible spectacle that started at shortly before 5 o'clock yesterday morning, beginning 
the longest and most terrible day in the history of the Olympic Games, either ancient or modern. Our worst fears have been realized tonight. They have now said that there were 11 hostages. Two were killed in their rooms this mo yesterday morning. Nine were killed at the airport tonight. They're all gone. Here's further commentary on the situation from Jim McKay's longtime broadcast friend, Al Michaels. Jim did not over-dramatize anything in a situation where it would have, would have been very easy to do something like that. And he was cool, but he was also, in his own way, emotional. And you knew how his heart broke because of what was going on. Also commentary on the situation from longtime ABC Sports President, Rune Arledge. When I heard about the, the capturing of the Israeli athletes, and the fact that uh, this was going to be a very sensitive and, and long news story. I called for Jim to come and do it rather than the people who were scheduled to do it. Of all the people who congratulated him, the one that he appreciated most was a telegram from Walter Cronkite saying you did our industry proud today. And it was, uh, it was probably the defining moment in his career. Jim McKay's careful balance of not becoming overly emotional, but yet professional under the most heated of moments, showed his true character and respect for both his network and his fellow human beings. When next we meet, we'll do one final tribute to Jim McKay and his life and times. Until next time, I'm William Taylor, and this has been the Closet Sports Soundbite. Today on the Closet Sports Soundbite, we wrap up our tribute to the great Jim McKay. First, we'll open up with commentary from his longtime broadcast friend, Al Michaels goes into any hall of fame in any business to me has to possess two traits consistency combined with quality and for more than 30 years i can think of nobody in my business who has done it better or more often than jim mckay i'm one of the few people who remembers the very first wide world of sports show it's the first time i heard jim mckay and i thought to myself that's pretty good he would bring out the human side the international olympic committee should consider jim mckay the single most important person in the advancement of the olympic games during the 20th century jim has taught as much to as many people through the medium of television as anybody i can think of in the last 30 years Secondly, here's some commentary from his longtime boss at ABC Sports, Rune Arledge. And in Jim McKay, we found a person who not only understood and loved the essence of sport, but he had the vocabulary and the sensitivity to describe it in ways that people across America could identify with. All you have to do is tune in any weekend and listen to announcers trying to convey that feeling to people, none of whom has ever matched Jim. And you see what his legacy is, and that's why he deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. participating for the first time in the senior championship. Last year, you were just third in the junior. How do you account for the tremendous improvement in your skating, Peggy? Well, I worked hard this year. Jim McKay passed away on June 7th, 2008, at the age of 86. And thanks to his love for horse racing as well as the competitive spirit in general, his legacy will live on in the foreseeable future. We now close out with that most famous Jim McKay oration that he made on a weekly basis, the opening of ABC's Why Will the Sports. For the Closet Sports Soundbite, I'm William Taylor. A young man with dreams of becoming a doctor one day decided to switch collegiate majors from pre-med to speech. And the rest, as they say, is history for one Bill Fleming. He went on to do television in Detroit before NBC hired him in the late 1950s to work on The Today Show. Then switched over to ABC in 1961 to become part of Wide World of Sports. 
and would cover countless events from there on. This is Evil Knievel, and uh, his specialty in sports is to take a motorcycle up over a ramp and leap through the air some 90 feet. That's what he's going to try to do today, over 15 automobiles. Now, have you ever done 15 before, Evil? Bill, I never have. I uh, missed a jump up in the northwestern part of the United States over 13, and I was uh, hospitalized and laid up for nearly five months, and I sure hope that doesn't happen today. Pearson go high. Pearson now has the lead. Teddy tries to go back down on the inside as they come out of the fourth turn. They only have about 750 yards to go. Oh! It's a straight away. They did hit. Teddy smashes into the wall. Will he come across the start finish line? Then 100 yards from it. Here comes Pearson. Pearson is going to try to make it across the finish line. Teddy has his car going. Pearson's going to win it. Oh, gosh. He covered the Olympics, bobsleds, track relays, and yes, even chess events. He was able to get an interview with the somewhat reclusive Bobby Fischer leading into the 1972 World Chess Championships, a feat that many thought was near impossible to accomplish. Bill Fleming also enjoyed covering the annual Ohio State-Michigan football game as a proud alumnus of the Mighty Blue. He also covered the Sugar Bowl. Here's a sample of his work from January 1, 1970. Ladies and gentlemen, on this final day of the centennial year of college football, it's really an honor to have with us seven members of the all-time All-America football team as voted by the Football Writers Association of America. Ernie Never, Bronco Nagurski, Mel Hine, Don Hudson, Jay Berwanger, Bob Suffrage. And least not forget, his voice opened up one of the most famous ABC sports shows of all time. Bringing you competition from among the finest bowlers in the world. It's the Pro Bowlers Tour. This ABC sports exclusive is brought to you by Monroe. First in shocks around the world. Replace your worn shocks with Monroe. You'll feel the difference. And by Johnson's Baby Shampoo. Simple enough to use every day from Johnson and Johnson. Bill Fleming passed away on July 20th, 2007, at age 80. Without a doubt, he was a marquee voice for a golden age in sports television. For the Closet Sports Soundbite, I'm William Taylor.